Well, welcome and good morning. As uh, Doug had said, I'm just going to give you an overview of what we may want to consider in, in uh, a framework, and the other speakers will get uh, drilled down into dealing specifically with flavonoids. So my required disclosure slide. First of all, we know that um, a lot of these nutrient-based values, um, there are very specific uh, uh, elements that have been considered by committees in the past, looked at nutrient intakes and looking at uh, adequacy. Prevention of chronic disease is, is widely used, as well as the avoidance of too high in, in intake, so you're dealing more with the safety component of nutrients. But let the first talk about what we're, we're mean by bioactives or non-essential nutrients. And these are ones that can be oxidized as fuels or those that provide a carbon skeleton and amino groups for endogenous synthesis of the body. So in other words, they can't be made by the body. It's that which we would ingest. But they could have health benefits and be a part of our, our healthy diet. But they also don't result in a biochemical or clinical uh, symptom of deficiency. Thus, they're non-essential nutrients. So we wanted to know, it, it could an inadequate intake of these compromise our health? And it could be that we've not yet identified this possibility because we're still working on uh, ad adequate analytical methodology. And as we get better with our analytical methods, we're able to identify some of these compounds more, thus then looking at uh, some of the effects they have on an individual. So we want to know, well, what would then go into establishing a framework that if we want to make a public health recommendation for these components, what would that look like? First of all, of course, we need the scientific evidence. And we always look to the gold standard of the randomized uh, intervention uh, type of trials that give you a causality. But lots of times prior to that, we've looked at observational data. So we have an association with that component. And if we want to look at mechanisms, then we've used the animal and in vitro type of studies. So all three of these are very critical uh, need of evidence. But for these, of course, we need to know first, what are people eating? And the way we do that is through our dietary assessment methods. And I listed several of the more common type of methods, oftentimes with epidemiological study, the most a uh, common one is the food frequency questionnaire, but in all of these, what we need to consider is uh, supplement intake, and oftentimes there's a lack of databases for that. So if we want to look at total dietary intake, we need to consider that also. And as most of us in this room are well aware of the challenges in looking at all of these dietary assessment methods, first of all, we have to rely on an individual's ability to remember what they ate. I know I, I would have trouble even telling you what I ate this morning, let alone if you're going back a few days. It's easier to estimate a whole food than if we're going down to actual constituent within that food. So, uh, so to do so, we need to have good food composition databases. And as we all know, there is a critical need to keep these updated and reliable. It's very expensive a type of work. And there's a lot of variability in these. There's food processing, cooking procedures, food storage, seasonal variation. And you look at bioavailability of these components. I listed here some of the ones that USDA's Agriculture Research Service has for those who would have some of the um, bioactive components that we're discussing and the years that they were besides the standard reference ones that come out each year as they update that database. 
And so what we often look to is biomarkers. And there's biomarkers of exposure, which I'll discuss in a moment, which is then looking at food intake biomarkers of effect. But regardless, we're looking at a causal link to the outcome itself. And you need to have those which are feasible, valid, reproducible, sensitive, and specific. So that is asking a lot of these. If we're looking at a biomarker expo exposure, it needs to be validated. Um, and you're looking at nutrient in the blood, or you can look at balance studies as has been used in setting DRI um, reference values, and looking at inadequate as well as excess intakes. And you can look at the actual substance itself, but oftentimes it's down to the metabolite of that based on uh, metabolism. So you need to know all of that. Um, and as I have said before, with a biomarker exposure, there's very few that are reliable and have been validated. Um, and it's critical in estimating these, especially from the observational studies, and your dietary assessment method must be taken into account. So for doing uh, clinical studies, you can look at the actual incident of the disease, but more often you're looking at uh, uh, a risk factor that you'd want to be valid and modifiable. And thus, we're talking about a biomarker of effect, which is an intermediary endpoint. And it indicates a normal biological uh, or pathogenic process or a, ph a pharmacological response to an intervention. And this, as I had said previously, it's that which is causally related to and predicted of, of a health outcome. Again, you need re reliable, validated surrogate endpoint of disease, but there, as many of us know, there are really very few of these. In fact, I listed here the ones that the FDA recognizes, so it's a very limited number for coronary heart diseases, total LDL cholesterol and blood pressure, polyps for colon and rectal cancer, blood sugar levels, insulin resistance for diabetes, bone mineral density for osteoporosis or mild cognitive impairment for dementia. So as many of you know, if you wanted a health claim, you better have one of these as a surrogate endpoint. Now, they rely especially on NIH to come indicate these. It's not that the FDA is making this up to make it hard for those of you that want to submit an application. It's that based on a lot of scientific evidence to come to these conclusions for a surrogate endpoint. Uh, for these biomarkers affect there to predict harm or they can be beneficial. But one thing we all know is that not all risk biomarkers are surrogate endpoints of disease. And they could be in a causal pathway, but that doesn't mean that we've had enough scientific evidence to validate that, and this is especially to, true of HDL cholesterol. Uh, back in 2010, when I was with the agency, we uh, uh, funded a uh, panel a committee through the National Academy of Sciences to come up with a type of framework. What would it take to validate a surrogate endpoint for disease, and in that report they identified three areas, an analytic, first an analytical validation, a qualification process, and then utilization, and you could read for yourselves what these are comprised of, but I would invite you to look at that report, which is the evaluation of biomarkers and surrogate endpoints and chronic disease that was released in 2010. Now, again, as with the biomarkers effect, we have many challenges here there, that there are very limited ones of these, and as I had said before, not all risk biomarkers are surrogate endpoints. And most diseases, especially cancer, lack a good surrogate endpoint. But science marches on, and we need to be able to examine these, and a lot of our evidence is dependent on these risk biomarkers, and we know as I, that there are several pathways to disease. So um, 
these are used in filling critical uh, paths in a DRI process. So if you look at these types of studies, intervention studies, if you're going out as far as disease, oftentimes that's impossible. It could be cost-wise, they're very expensive, but also ethically, so we need to have those intermediary endpoints. And in observation studies, that's just giving us an association. Oftentimes, if you're looking at a whole food, you're an estimate, but an estimate, an estimate, if you're drilling down into what could be a bioactive, it gets less um, reliable. And of course, as I had said, your animal in vitro studies are, are good for mechanisms or safety type of data. But we've used these prospective studies to show that fruit and vegetable consumption is beneficial. The catch is what are the nutrients or nutrients that are non-nutrients that are responsible for this effect? Could it be a substitution effect? And again, disease is multifactorial. I'm going to just have a couple of slides here briefly on where well, we've used fiber. Fiber has an AI. It's a non-essential nutrient. Um, and it was based on levels observed to prevent coronary heart disease. And they included observation, clinical, and mechanistic data. And um, there was a secondary endpoint. They looked at reduction of risk for diabetes for a recommendation of uh, fiber intake. Again, it was a fiber per se because we're looking at a dietary pattern that could be, have a, a beneficial effect. And as those of you that do fiber research know, it can be difficult and needs to be looked at again in total dietary pattern. And or is it other components within fruit, vegetables, or cereal products that are responsible for that effect? Um, but the basis for the AI, the panel found it uh, very sufficient through epidemiological studies that uh, individuals that consume these uh, had a reduced risk of coronary heart disease. And together with these large prospective cohort studies with clinical as well as mechanistic evidence, an AI for fiber was able to be set. So the question is, should we focus on disease risk reduction? Are we looking at markers of health and wellness feasible? So do we want to look at maintaining normal physiological function throughout adulthood that would then lead to health promotion? As we know, there are a lot of emerging biological indicators of disease risk and health promotion, but they're going to be in an intermediary pathway. And since the DRI process, there have been a variety of biomarkers that have been used, and a lot of that is, as science has advanced, uh, our knowledge and methodological uh, analysis have improved too. Or do we want to look at multiple risk biomarkers that are all showing a benefit uh, on a particular health outcome? And we know of several of these, especially related to coronary heart disease. So, but regardless, we need to have valid, reliable, and reproducible scientific data. We also need to understand the role of the nutrient in a food matrix, and dietary panders may indicate uh, reduced risk of chronic disease. But we still keep falling back on needing these large randomized clinical trials for establishing a relationship between intake of nutrients, whether it's essential and non-essential, and reducing the risk of chronic disease. And as we also know, there are a lot of claims out there with very limited scientific evidence. So we need evidence-based public health recommendations to put out to the healthy population. So I have here, should the framework, it needs to anticipate decisions when data is limiting, operate under conditions of uncertainty. So I said the DRI model has evolved over time. Um, or should, and, and looking at the mechanism for making dietary recommend did intake recommendations. Do we need possibly a new terminology that wouldn't be a, a DRI? And if so, then what would this look like? <laughs> 
So in summary, we need updated reliable food composition databases, a valid measure of looking at food intake. Again, valid, reproducible, reliable biomarkers of effect. Um, elements of path forward, they have to be evidence-based scientific data. So a, a, a big question is what endpoints are we willing to accept? And should the shift be from disease risk reduction to one of health maintenance? And if we're doing that, what are we going to be calling that? So I leave you with what is the potential harm on making an evidence-based public health recommendation on data based on large prospective cohort studies when there is a lack of large randomized controlled trials with validated surrogate endpoints versus the potential harm of not making it. Thank you.